Welcome, thinkers, to Season 4, Episode 2 of Thinking Critically. This is the first episode in the new two-weekly cycle. So for those who don't know, we are going to move to every other Friday for new episodes. Hopefully this will give you a chance to catch up on Seasons 1 through 3. Otherwise, the only other thing to add is I'm now streaming, kind of, on Twitch, both my homebrew D&D campaign you've heard throughout this show, and also occasionally some of my favourite video games. So you can find me at twitch.tv slash thinkingcritically. Otherwise, let's get on with the show. Today's topic is motivation. And today, this is a very special episode, as once again, I'm joined by my friends at Tabletop Journeys, Josh, Lewanika, and Glenn. Thank you ever so much for joining us today, guys. Can you tell us a little bit about yourselves on the show? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for having us. So this is Josh uh, from Tabletop Journeys, of course, joined with my uh, my erstwhile co-hosts, uh, Glenn and Lewanika. And, uh, you know, Daniel, I love that we uh, have the opportunity to do this again, honestly. Like, coming on your show last year was one of the highlights of our year last year, uh, and I'm really glad that uh, we've been able to collaborate on a couple of projects and that uh, and that we're back on thinking critically this is going to be a good time uh so tabletop journeys is a uh, a podcast largely about uh well has has had a lot of content about dungeons and dragons 5e but is really all about uh tabletop role-playing games in general uh we do two episodes a week uh on saturdays we uh release uh, discussion style episodes where we will talk about a, a particular mechanic or a particular game session or uh, anything really to do with any aspect of tabletop gaming. You know, we love, uh, you know, like we say on our show, we, we love having awesome people come in to talk about the awesome things that they're doing. Um, so tabletop creators who are putting out Kickstarter campaigns or writing their own games and everything like that. You know, we love having, uh, having them on. Uh, we do so rules, deep dive stuff type, type stuff on on saturdays uh and then uh tuesdays uh are actual play days and so we do a variety of actual play campaigns uh we do a uh a campaign with our patreon subscribers which is a tremendous amount of fun they're they're deep in the Feywild right now so that's a that's a good time for everybody uh but we also feature other games on there too um the subscribers to our show probably just heard or probably in the middle of hearing uh the actual play that we did with the folks that created a powered by the apocalypse build based on the real thing um uh, back in uh a couple months ago we uh with you we had uh, our against the dark master uh ap which was uh, which was fun and so so fun so mm-hmm. much fun yeah Tuesdays are AP days. Uh, Saturdays are when we get to go ahead and, and uh, pull out our our notebooks and our pocket protectors and our our spectacles and uh, and do really geeky deep dive into uh, rules and mechanics and talk to awesome people. So it's basically and our uh, show. Yeah. of course I'm I'm one of those awesome people. Today. Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you were you were on our uh, we did uh, we did that two part space episode uh, when uh, when we were on your show last year. So uh, and we we're awesome at, at the time that we met last time. Uh, Glenn wasn't able to join us. I think he had just joined the crew actually at the point that we did mm-hmm. that interview so uh i had i was like two weeks in yeah green <laughs> D- didn't want to throw him to the wolves just yet you know because uh because you know dan you are a tough interview really i mean very intense <laughs> uh uh you know uh, very 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 harsh critic of uh take of no things. prisoners yeah, yeah exactly. very formal every uh, gray hair on this beard came after that in- no i'm just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was still kind of in my uh, interview slash uh, orientation process, and they hadn't decided your, your probation yet if they could period, trust. Yeah. T- probation, better word. They hadn't decided yet if they could trust me in front of an international audience. Human resources <laughs> hadn't cleared his paperwork yet. It was a mess. Yeah, yeah it was. It was awful. <laughs> that was. Uh, that was all the way back, approximately February twenty twenty one. Yes, season one, episode eighteen. Wow, I can see from that was a year ago. It, so. Yeah. Uh yeah. Wow. Yeah, That's almost crazy. almost to the day. Yeah. Funny how time flies, isn't it? And I'm honored to still be obviously in in frequent contact with you guys. So again, thank, thanks for coming back. I guess. <laughs> well, thanks for well, having us. I tell people all the time, whether you and I are speaking directly or not, you and I are talking weekly because I'm listening to your show all the time. <laughs> um, you know, um, 
there were a couple weeks where I missed an episode or two, or I've decided, look, I, I really like that episode. So I'm going to, I'm going to definitely come back to that episode. So, you know, I have, I have like a playlist of podcasts that I'm re-listening to because it, it really um, helps my creative process. So. Oh, I'm very happy to be uh, helping you with that. Uh, although you're not as good a fan anymore because you've missed a couple of episodes. So, yeah, well, you know, yeah. so. you, you, your Sean and Flap <laughs> episode, by the way. So that's, that is a podcast that I found a while, oh, just yes. to talk about how great your show is. First of all, Dan, uh, uh, so that was a podcast that I had found years ago that I put on, like whenever I need something sort of irreverent and ridiculous and funny, like mm -hmm. Sean and Flop is amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I loved the interview that you did with, with, uh, with those cats. That was a, uh, that was a lot of fun. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. An interesting one again, as they all are, but uh topic of today's episode is motivation. So gentlemen, what does that mean to you in the D and D and wider TTRPG framework? Luenica, why don't you start with this one? Yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in. As I did in our previous episode, it means two different, it, it means similar things, but two different things, depending on if you're talking about from the player perspective or the storyteller perspective. So I'm going to jump right in from the player perspective here and just talk about the fact that it really is the inciting incident. It really is the why player characters do a thing. Um, mm -hmm. And as much as I'm a background guy, that's rarely the why. That's the perspective, right? So motivation to me is why do they leave the farm? Why do they attack the castle? Um, and, and, and there's an element of that that players have to bring to their character and they have to build into their character. So no matter where they want to go with this character, what class, what lineage, what features, what feats, um, None of that, there's no mechanic for motivation. Mm. Uh, it is something that needs to be written into the story. That's the storyteller piece, but it is also something that each individual player has to bring to their character. So they have to decide, you know, why does John McClane deal with all these guys? Because his wife is there and because he's a cop and it's the right thing to do. So he's going to go do the hard thing. Uh, he doesn't want to have to do the hard thing. In fact, most of Die Hard was him not wanting to do the hard thing, <laughs> you know, Oh, come to the party, have a good time. Right. right. But he did it. Uh, his motivation was because at the end of the day, he's a guy who does the right thing. And I think that's, that's what I think of when I think of motivation and that doesn't have to be every character's motivation. It can be the coin, right? It can be the adventure. It can be all of these other things, but I think motivation is uniquely that one piece of the game that does not have a specific mechanic mm -hmm. unless there's a spell that forces you to do that. And that's a whole different <laughs> agency discussion, which was a great episode you did previously. But. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, I'd, I'd never, I'd never thought of it as, is that despite reading the book a lot and making a number of characters in my time, it's escaped me that that motivation, like there isn't a more clearer way to help new players make some motivational piece for their characters yeah. and i always say to the guys in my game when they're making new characters of which to to have had to recently i've said from day one i'm like guys make sure you have a reason to go adventuring like something has to be quite big yeah. here to push you out and one of the guys came back with a whole bunch of stuff and i was like i love it sounds great but what there isn't anything really there that would push you away from that because like your family are fine the world is fine as you know it there's no reason why would you why would you travel with these bunch of murder a strangers to go and do some random mission that somebody's you know yeah. sub, you know just told you allegedly told you that is of utmost importance like there needs to be something quite compelling there i can't, yeah. I can't let's work together to try and divine it out of what you've got so yeah. far and that is well difficult yeah <laughs> sometimes i mean i actually think that when uh in the wheel of time series and in the first season of the wheel of time you know when you've kind of got moraine and you've got like this group of of hillbillies from the two rivers that have never known anything except for the village that they grew up in the reticence that they showed about about the quest that they were being put on and told you know you are the people that have to go ahead and do this like there is there is nobody else you are the people you are the ones that have to go and do this and the reticence that they showed kind of throughout that entire 
jaunt into the the murderous mouth of evil Mm -hmm. was so tangible and so palpable it's like yep that's believable like i can imagine you know if somebody showed up at my door right now and said hey you know josh hate to tell you you're the chosen one you need to leave behind everything that you've ever known and come with me i think reticence would be would be kind of the uh the first word that would pop to mind and there'd be yep. several four letter words that followed shortly thereafter. So, or, or <laughs> right. even a, a, a happy, uh, sod off. This is not happening right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you get the wrong cat. Like that's not my bag. <laughs> and, and that's the thing about trying to motivate players. You know, you're a hundred percent right. Lee part of it's got to come from the player themselves. That's why mm-hmm. when we've talked about session zero before in the social contract, we've made a point of saying you need to talk to your players and say, that it's not just my responsibility to keep the game together and make it fun for you. It's everybody's responsibility. So you have to come up with that reason why you want to be involved with these other jokers. Or, you know, if you decide to rob them all and run home, you're going to have a really boring night by yourself. Yeah. So everybody's got to work on coming up with their own motivation for they want why they want to be part of it. Uh, but then story can also motivate. The downside there being uh, the danger of perception. Right, because going with the Wheel of Time series, which is an amazing show, and I've been reading the books since I was like a sophomore in high school, and they came out like one every two years forever, and then Dave, and then Robert Jordan died, oh God, and then his son took. It's been crazy. Like I've been a fan for, I've been in this for the long haul, guys. <laughs> um, He's the OG Wheeler. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I got, I've got some compatriots out there with me. Marty's been reading it as long as I have. One of the our Patreons and uh, fans of our show. And friend of ours. But anyway, I digress. But when you're motivating with story, you've either got to craft, you you got to, as a storyteller, from that perspective, craft it well or handle it delicately to avoid the the scary word railroad. Um, Because when you're like, well, you're going to go on this quest because otherwise you're going to burn and kill everybody in your entire village. Yeah. You know, some, if you, if you present it wrong, Sometimes players can bulk, but hopefully if everybody's on the same page of the social contract and trying to work together, that won't be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, because otherwise, how would the reluctant hero ever get drug in? The answer there is if you're gonna if you're trying to play that reluctant hero, you've got to come up with your motivations. You've got to come up with your reasons why you want to stay involved, why you want to step out the door, why you want to do the next right thing or the next cool thing or the next dangerous thing, depending on you know your motivation. I would, uh, to kind of use the wheel of time, since that seems to be the great example that we have here today, if I were running that as an RPG, I would probably not have role-played the preamble that we saw in episode one. I would have started that campaign in media res with the Trolloc attack. However, in my session zero, I would have said, how are we building these characters? And I would have said, okay, now that we have these characters that everybody wants to play, let's find ways to weave you all together. So your perspective is you're all friends. You've grown up together. You have complicated relationships, but they're tight relationships despite those complications. And just kind of weave that into the fabric of this is where we start. So when we start in the middle of this festival and Trollocs are attacking, defending each other, taking care of each other's family, getting each other to safety, looking out for each other. That's where we start. And that hopefully would provide that in and out of game motivation so that they can then move forward and allow them to role play the reticence, knowing that at the end of those role play scenes, they're still going on the adventure. That to me would be how I would do the wheel of time if I were to try to recreate that type of scenario Mm. because i think that would be very difficult to take these people built play a couple sessions or play a session where you're home you're enjoying and this is where you want to be and then say oh by the way people attack and then they're going to chase you down and burn your whole village and i think what would have happened in that moment would have been just that the dreaded rr you know it would have been the railroad at that point because then it's like but what if I don't want to leave? Are they going to attack then anyway? Or you're just making me do this. Whereas if you start the game with the, we're going on the adventure, we're going to start in media res and here's where you go. I think that would work best. And I mean, exactly that. The difference that I would make if I was running the wheel of time, because you're, you're spot on. The biggest difference that I would make to motivate them would be including key pieces. And it's difficult because Trollocs don't speak English, but, Mirdrill do, 
right? So the Eyeless, yeah. I don't think they've actually called them Mirror Jewel in the show yet, but that's their proper they name. Have <laughs> Although that might not be the way it's pronounced because like to me, Nynaeve's name is Nenev and has been for, I don't know, <laughs> 30 years. But if you put in that piece that makes it obvious to them, obvious to each player character, that they are after them specifically, whether it's the eyeless pointing them out and saying that one or <laughs> something that makes it so that it's not a question, dude, these guys are here for us and our friends and family are in danger because of us. That's that last piece that'll help push a player, I think, in the motivating factor. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something I, here's a mistake that I, I always like to bring in my mistakes on the show because I like to other people to learn from them. <laughs> so <laughs> I've already done the hard work for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is I, I foolishly went way back when I started my gimmick of trying to get the players together was that they were, they'd been summoned to the, the ruler of the city's castle. He's got a job for them, but looking at their backstory, their payment was going to be something unique to them. So that in the letters he sent each of them individually was like, I know that you're here because of X, Y, Z, because I'm the leader and I know everything. <laughs> if you do this mission for me, I will give you this piece of information or I know you're trying to, you're running from the law so I can give you amnesty if you do this thing for me, which on paper, I was like, Hey, that's great. It gets them all together and it gets them all on this first mission which is great, except that that first mission was like the prologue of the story. Yeah. So once the world opened up and there was a bigger thing to do, I'm very lucky that my players were just like, yeah, we'll just go with it because there wasn't, in hindsight, really enough impetus there from me to be like, yeah, but why do you specifically, you five, you've done your job, you've got your payment from the, the, the city owner yeah. guy, why would you still want to go on to this big scary thing that somebody's saying is big and scary that you should definitely go and do yeah other than no nah, i'm done like <laughs> i've done my bit wash my hands goodbye made my money got my scars yeah, yeah. man i try to think i think it was when we were doing one of our subclass episodes i think it was the rangers when we were talking about um and the the name escapes me because i i'm in gaming hangover this morning uh, uh <laughs> the the one that basically sits in the woods growing mushrooms and and having animal friends the is, it the, is that the gloom swarm stalker or the, the swamp keeper whatever whatever that one swarm keeper. <laughs> swarm keeper yes yes the swarm keeper right that was one of my big takeaways after reading through the swarm keeper is why would this character ever be an adventurer this is a character that by model is content to sit around in his mud hut tending to his mushrooms and you know making sure that his moss isn't disturbed by whatever creature is running through it at that particular moment in time and so like that was i, I found that was a tricky bit to go ahead and be like well, mm. why would this why would they actually want to be an adventurer um and just recently we talked about the the new strixhaven book and there were pieces of that that were the same thing like uh there's a the book's been out for a couple of months, so I won't spoil it, but there is a party and there's a moment where one of the other goers at the party gets ill and you're supposed to want to follow this character and find out why they got ill. And I'm like, dude, I've, I've been at that party. Like when someone is like, holding their mouth and running to the restroom the impulse is not oh what's going on with with timmy you know it's <laughs> it's let's give timmy some space and maybe a glass of water and open a window like that's you yeah. know like he'll need some aspirin in a couple hours you know like that's Let, lay off the backs yeah, yeah like, right exactly yeah. you know and <laughs> we'll so, find like, him in the garden later whatever yeah. Somebody, <laughs> exactly. somebody, somebody will hang out outside the room just to make sure he doesn't die in there and that's yeah yeah you know slap his face when they pour him into the cab we're adventurers not hair holders you know it's like that's right. <laughs> yeah. with that with that swarm keeper example with those kind of things you can always take it to the extreme as a world as the as the gm or the world builder to be like well it's the end of the world so your little haven in the forest will be destroyed Threat, and that's yeah. you know that it's easy and possible but the thing i, I don't really like that too much not to i don't i'm not poo-pooing on i mean i've done it so yeah. but i don't want to poo-poo on anyone else's that. thing but Right. It's it's like a that's obviously the extreme, and b that reveals a little bit too many of the cards for my liking. Like right at the beginning, to be like, well, it's going to end. Just go and play my game, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, so, right. yeah. I, I am a big fan of finding unique and interesting ways to personalize motivations, and mm -hmm. uh, I actually just posted on our Facebook group about this just the other day because I saw a meme. And I put it on the group and I talked about my one of my own campaigns that I run, the Land of 18 Seas Chronicles of Barstock. It's a wonderful homebrew campaign that I run for some 
some good friends and our kids, like my 15 year old, his 17 and 15 year old play. And, and it's a wonderful time. But when I started that campaign in our local shop, I decided I wanted to do something different. And I had just rewatched the Mark Wahlberg film, Four Brothers. And I said, how cool that you have these four very different people. Their only tie is this family, this, this made family, this combined blended family, their adoptive mother, and the fact that they are tight. They argue with each other. They don't get along. They do different things. They are very different personalities, but they are brothers and they are tight. And at the end of the day, even when one of them ended up, big spoiler alert for a movie that came out in 2005, but um, one of them ended up being the catalyst for the whole problem in the movie. Uh, mm -hmm. But he, because his brothers were there, he's like, no. And he turns on what he had previously done and helps the family. And I loved that concept. And I said, that's a powerful motivation. So I built into this campaign, and it was actually the start of this campaign world, an orphanage. And the idea is all the player characters were in the orphanage. That allows any player to play anything they want, lineage, background, race, whatever. But the one thing I said, this is the concept of the game. Your love for your brothers is not ever going to be in question. You can fight, you can argue, you can try to do whatever, but when push comes to shove, you guys have each other's back. That's how we start this campaign. Now, if things change as the game goes, that's your agency, you do that. But there is no question of the bond you have for each other. And I loved that as a motivation. So as we went on, all I had to do is put one of them in jeopardy, and everybody was all in. Done. It was an amazing, it has been, it's an ongoing campaign. So it still is a really powerful motivating factor. Like when we're doing something and, and one of the players will be like, he just threatened my brother. I know what we're doing next. When you hear that at your table, you're like, man, all the heavy lifting is done. It doesn't have to be a world ending plot. It just has to be a bully at the bar, a sheriff who's not too cool or what have you. They have each other. They worry about each other and they don't always get along. And I think that's that's kind of what I think about, about alternate ways to motivate characters. When you build those, the background, like I said, is the perspective. The backstory can be the way to motivate. There's not a mechanic for backstory. And uh, there's tons of people talking about, oh, don't get three page backstories, you know, try to keep it to a paragraph. And there's all kinds of different opinions on that. But if we as storytellers think about backstory as our only way into the motivation, that's probably a good place to start. Yeah, but it can't stop there. Like that's the other thing too, is that like Absolutely. it had like that's the motivation to get started. I think that the 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 fine line that storytellers that we need to walk as storytellers is making sure that we don't overly reward players so that that the game kind of goes off the rails, right? Uh, make sure that we kind of keep like keep hitting the, the little dopamine button every once in a while, so that the players continue to want to move through the machinations that we're putting in front of them without ever kind of second guessing the initial motivation about why they came in there in the first place. So that's rewards is a great motivating factor, but you have to tailor your rewards for the level of the game. I tend to think of it in terms of tiers. At tier one, the things that I reward are going to be very different than the things I reward in tier two. And now that both of my ongoing campaigns are in tier three, I am doing vastly different types of rewards. And it doesn't have to be like physical rewards or money or stuff or either. No. Like it can just be like satisfying story. Like one of the things that I loved doing at my table is each game picks an aspect of one player's background and weaves it kind of into the story in some way. Like player X has a complicated relationship with his father. And so that means that that is going to come into, you know, maybe the big bad is somehow threatening his home village and his father is under threat or his father is in on it. You know, we talked about the connection to the wheel of time, like maybe his father's in on it and helping the big bad get into the village or for whatever reason, you know, kind of playing on one aspect, one, one bullet point from one player's background becomes a thread in the tapestry of the game world as a whole. So 
Ah, see, and there you were going with the Wheel of Time reference again with the weave, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, like that's yeah, you know, not too bad. And, and the series. pattern. <laughs> it, <laughs> it it's really a is. really good series. As someone who has not read the books, I am <laughs> thoroughly enjoying the series for what it is, recognizing the challenges for those who've read the books. Well, as a person who read the books, that's how I go into it too. I'm like, this is not going to be like the books. It's impossible. They couldn't do it. So I'm watching it as its own thing. That's how I'm still enjoying it because some people are mad already. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's a wonderful suit, visually stunning, but very well done. And it really applies to the tabletop game and the D&D framework to bring us back to center a little bit. But it, it covers all of those types of things. And Josh, you're right. You got to continue. The motivations have to not always be tangible. Sometimes it's so-and-so just gets recognition when he goes to town. Oh, that's yeah. so-and-so. That's a motivating factor. You know, it's like Firefly mm -hmm. when Jane goes to that planet where they think he's a god. You know, like yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. Why can we go to the crappy planet where everybody thinks <laughs> I'm a hero? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you said, uh, Glenn, that some people are mad already uh, regarding Will of Time. And I think you just you just described the internet. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <so. laughs> <That's fair. laughs> uh, but I really liked what, what we were saying uh, when we were talking about tying backgrounds and not just about the initial motivation, but continuing on the way that Josh does it. Because we talk about it all the time. You know, that's I will never tell a player just 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 a paragraph or two for your background is all I need. Because every detail they give me, unless they get totally off the rails and start trying to define the world for me, at which point, you know, we'll have a conversation to work that out. But every detail they give you is a piece of information that you can work to make the game world come more to life, to add more motivation to their character for what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, and if, if you're not looking into your character's backstories and you're not trying to find ways to motivate them that are specific and personal to them, you know, without being heavy handed, you're really, really missing a gold mine of an opportunity because if they spent hours writing this three page background and you read it and say, Hey, that's pretty cool. And you never look at it again. It's not just not motivating. It could be very much demotivating in your mm, game yeah. to, you know, have them feel like, well, I went through all that work and you just don't even care. Yeah. So paying attention to what your character's backstory says will also kind of tell you what your character wants and give mm. you directions to help motivate them. Yeah, it'll definitely help you figure out how to motivate folks. I know when I write backstories, because I used to write epochs. <laughs> <laughs> Novellas. But, like, you know, uh, like used to? really, really <laughs> long, detailed things. And then I, I have learned since to pair that back significantly. You know, sometimes headcanon needs to remain headcanon. But I still like doing a backstory. One, it helps keep me focused on the character. Look, we're adults. I don't play any single game five days a week. Mm -hmm. I'm playing most games twice a month, some of them once a month or once a quarter. So to go from session to session, I need something to help me out. So I have started doing, and I actually started this a couple of years ago with some Palladium games that Glenn was working on, just doing a bullet point timeline, and I would leave blanks. I didn't name cities. I didn't name units. I might name a one or two specific NPC characters that I interacted with because in my head, the names sounded really cool together or whatever. Dalton and uh, Kenzie come to mind. Like I named those two characters. I named almost nobody else involved with that whole thing and his rival or whatever. I named the main character, his love interest and his romantic rival. And his best friend slash brother. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and nobody else did I name, and I kind of talked about the type of unit they were in, but I didn't name the unit or what have you. I talked about the type of community they came from, but I didn't name or place the location of the community. And then I left blanks like, okay, so this is the year they met. This is the year they fell in love. There's like years in between. And I said, you know, fill in what you want anywhere in here. And, and it's like, you do whatever you want with the rest of this. These are just the key points that matter to me focusing on who the character is and what the character right. wants to do. And Glenn specifically is amazing with that kind of thing. And I think part of that is we have a connection that goes back for many more years than I deserve to be on this planet, but uh, <laughs> that we can kind of speak each other's written language and unwritten language so that it works really well. And for players to kind of be with their storytellers long-term, you'll get that. I'm sure you have mm. players that you've been with long enough where it's like you get what they're driving at. So you have the ability to deliver what they're driving at. And that give and take just works smoothly. 
Um, mm-hmm. I've built that with Glenn. I've built that with Josh. So it's like there's certain things that I can just do and say, and they know where I'm going. And then they can also very easily, they feel comfortable saying, that's really not what I was going for in this game. I like the idea. Maybe you can save that for another one. How about this? So we can kind of build on that. And then we can go f- forward with that. But right. bullet points work really well for backstories. They can be relatively short. I think uh, for Dalton, that was a page and a half, maybe, if if that. When you gave it to me, by the time I was done with it, I think it was three. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, again, you're not wrong. We know each other well enough, and we've been playing with each other long enough that once you handed me your backstory, I knew exactly what to do with it to make it the kind of story for the character you were trying to play. Yeah. And it was easy to keep Dalton motivated as we moved through that game just because of all the heartstrings that you handed me on a silver mm. platter that I could apply. Oh, yeah. yeah. When I do backstories, we'll hand my storyteller pathos tangible issues and some kind of screw up that my character did in the past so you have a way to say this is coming back to bite you you have a way to say this is the issue that you have to fix and then you have a way to say this is the lesson you learned what do you do with that Mm -hmm. (laughs) i love that point there even if you made around the, the way you architected your backstory there because and it's very important to me because i felt not the pain, but the challenge of having a player, as I said, one of my more recent players is having to make a new character and they're all level 10, it's like midway through a campaign. So there's a bit more baggage that has to, there's a bit more hoops they have to jump through to be like, not just why do you want to go adventuring? It's why do you want to go adventuring with these guys? <laughs> Cause you can't, you could have 101 fantastic reasons to go adventuring, but it, unfortunately you're kind of tied to these guys now because <laughs> we're, we're two and a half years into the campaign. So sorry. And he has a very active imagination and loves fantasy and loves popular culture. So he comes back with all this stuff and I'm like, it's great. I just have to think now quite a lot about how that impacts the world. And I think it's can be easy for players who are only players to get lost in their imagination. So for example, he wanted to be an Aladrin who are uh, historically from the Feywild and they come to the material plane every so often. So I was like, okay, here's a challenge for us. I've got to think now, Eladrin, Feywild weren't really in my campaign before. Now they are. What does that mean for my campaign? You need to help. We need to work together on this to boundaries and scope and and stuff like that. Why would you be traveling to the material plane? Is that something that happens frequently? If so, I kind of need to now think about incorporating that down the line. And maybe you meet another band of Eladrin who are like, oh, hey, we're on the material plane. We're here on holiday. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Spring break. <laughs> Spring break. T-shirts, balloons. <laughs> I'm just picturing a group of Aladdin with little uh, pocket cameras on the cords, walking around taking pictures. Oh, proper tourists, of, of, yeah. Of, of the eye <laughs> in London. One at the front with a flag on a stick. Yeah. Uh, so they know. <laughs> uh yeah so that that was again a unique challenge I'm like, i love this and this is really unique really special and really cool i just need to think you know give me a, some time which is why i always set a deadline before playing a week ahead because i'm like now i have a week to do a whole bunch of world building to, to integrate this kind of stuff but what you described there lee and Nika, around like almost like placeholder stuff to then empower the dm to comfortably fit that in in a way which isn't just when everybody joins back Oh, yeah, it turns out we're in a world of perpetual night because someone wanted to be a drow. Isn't it, there isn't this whiplash because of a single piece of information that has <laughs> made it awkward. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about motivating player characters. So to sim- it's the other side of the same coin with a similar theme, I want to hear about what motivates us all as players. Like why, do, why do you keep coming back to the table? Oh, man. <laughs> and that should see us through until tomorrow, maybe? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Maybe next week? <laughs> yeah. Like, wow. Wow. So I want Glenn to go first because I, I think I have a good answer, but I want to – I'll let Glenn – I answer the first one first. And- what do you mean you want me to go first? What if I don't want to go first? No, that's right. I'm not scared. <laughs> the double R. <laughs> so what keeps us coming back to the table as players? 
Yeah. Yeah. When you, when, I was expecting you to go the storyteller route and how we keep ourselves motivated as storytellers. But all right, let that, me change that's, my that's, mindset. That's my third question. Third yeah. question. Fair <laughs> enough. For hour number three. Yeah. <laughs> fun, man. I mean, that's the biggest one. Fun. Yeah. Fun and fantasy and a little bit of escape. You know, it's it's a chance to get out of my nine to five daily grind. Mm. It's a chance to walk away from all of the stress and crap going on out there in the real world. And all of the, the crazy things that we see on social media, regardless of which side of which issue you're sitting on, all of that gets really overwhelming. And role-playing uh, and sitting down to a table for a session of D&D &D or Aliens or Against the Dark Master, it doesn't really matter what game I'm playing. It just gives me that, aside from the social, because that's a big piece of it too. I mean, this is, this is like a loaded question. And you get the social contact, you're hanging out with your, with your best friends, hopefully, or making new friends, because that's awesome too. And you get to just immerse yourself in this, this other person who's larger than life in some way. I don't like to make paragons of perfection is what mm -hmm. was recently put out when we were working with Limitless Heroics. It was one of the terms that was thrown out there and I loved it. Um, I don't usually make paragons of perfection, but you know, they're still heroes. They're still larger than life. You know, they're still more capable than I living in a fantasy world, doing amazing things. You know, it's a chance to step into the Lord of the Rings. It's a chance to step into my favorite childhood fantasies. So it's a no brainer. That's, that's a whole lot of motivation right there. And it keeps me coming back and has for, I don't know, 40 years now. I mean, with the exception of early part of being a dad when there's no time to do anything else but work and take care of kids <laughs> um I've, I've been playing since i was nine so yeah eight maybe eight yeah we've all been playing for a super long time and for me i absolutely hear what you're saying glenn about the ability to dive into your favorite fantasy worlds and the ability to go ahead and take a little piece of literature or a little piece of some world that someone has created and explore it in your own mind and explore it at the table with your friends that is, I don't want to say that that is no part of my motivation, but that is only a very small part of my motivation. My almost entirety, uh, almost the entirety of the motivation for me to come back to the table is it's my favorite way to hang out, right? With my friends, right? It is the most rewarding thing for me to see my friends in that awesome role playing scenario. And that is something that, like, man, when, when I, I think, I think back to like some of the LARPing um, that Lewanika and I did mumble mumble years ago <laughs> and how much we celebrated our friends' victories, especially when they came at our defeat, right? Like that moment where it's like, oh man, uh, what you did there just really, uh, that's, that's, I hate you for that. And it was amazing. Those moments, like you can't, Look, I mean, yeah, I can do that at work, but like no one's going to celebrate the fact that I just <laughs> effed over one of my people that, <laughs> that I work with. Like they frown on that in public society, but at the game table, yeah, it, is, it so. is <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, for good reasons, you know, HR involved, uh, uh, you know, but at the game table, it's like for me, seeing the ingenuity of the people that I'm sitting at the table with, you know. I love surrounding myself with smart, creative, interesting people and seeing them take their idea and execute it in a way that I didn't anticipate or that surprised me or, or made me laugh or, or interested or whatever, right? Like whatever emotion it stirs up in me, seeing my friends do that is there is there is no drug on the world in the world that is better than that. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like, Oh wow. Holy crap. Glenn just did something amazing. And that's fantastic. Or like, I mean, I think back to like the against the dark master game, like the number of times that something amazing happened in that brief, like four or five hours that we played. And I just sat back and said, Holy shit. Wow. That was so cool. <laughs> that was that so was, solid. Oh, so solid, you know? And like, ah. Uh, like I, I live for that. I absolutely I, like. If I could bottle that and sell that, I'd be a millionaire because, like, <laughs> like there is there's just no feeling like that in the world. And You'd that's be Watson. absolutely, yeah, <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. You know, and and so that that's that's what kind of that's what keeps me coming back. Because I I kind of I'm always chasing that high, that high of like, he, and I think that that's kind of why I love kind of collaborative world building so much is because that's at the end of the day as a storyteller, that's what I want to be doing, or even as a player, that's what I want to do. Is I I want to. I want to share this 
aspect of creation with my friends and see where they're going to take it, you know, see how they can take the, this nugget that I'm going to throw out there uh, and where they're going to go with it. And, and then when it comes back to me, what has happened to it and now what can I do with it? And, and that sort of thing. I love the collaborative aspect of it. Yeah. Well said collaborative yeah. creation. I mean, Gelden the maker is my world builder name. I call myself a maker cause I love to create. It doesn't matter what it is. So very, very, very well said. Mine was, mine was surface. Yours was deeper. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And his touches on the first note, when you asked the question I wrote down, which is I'm chasing the scene, right? Yeah. Josh talked about, you can't get, uh, a better feeling than that, uh, even if you could put it in a bottle. Um, I've referred to it in a couple different uh, episodes where I'm like, I'm always, there's like certain scenes and I'm like, that's why I do this. Yeah. Uh, when we did our Aliens broadcast, there was, uh, there was a scene where our friend Steve on uh, the DNA podcast, his character shoots another character in the head and I, I saw it telegraphed. I'm like, that's the moment. Like I live for those moments yeah. when we were doing against the dark master and we got into that conversation about road bacon. Um, <laughs> I live for yeah. those moments. There's just something organic and creative. It's like yeah. in the universe, we deal with really complex f physical laws. There's nothing created that didn't come from something else, right? There's no new matter. There's no new energy or whatever in yeah. the creative space and in the creative mind, we are breaking those rules every time we throw dice yeah. and come up with an idea. It is the one space where we as people in this real mechanical, physical world can do something amazing. We can create just from our experiences and build something from where there was nothing. And I think that was, uh, that that's what I'm chasing always. Yeah. That's my motivation for coming back to this game 40 years in. Just real quick, that conversation about the road bacon, that is exactly what I'm talking about, right? Is that <laughs> that moment when you and 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 you, your cast, The Modest, are talking about the bacon and right, you guys are all talking and like my character in a huff just decides to ride off because he is done with your frivolity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and Luanika, your character makes that subtle comment like, don't worry about my brother-in-law. Like he got his shit. Like, don't worry. He's like, you know, and I think, I think Glenn, it was your character said, oh yeah, no, I saw how much he ate. And then <laughs> you very, very succinctly with the sniping line, like, yeah, well, what you probably didn't notice is you probably got some of everybody else's too. Like, it's <laughs> like that little moment where I'm just sitting there like, oh, you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> party banter really, really helps bring it all oh, together. Too. Yeah, it exactly. Helps, it helps you make know. it, you know, yeah. I mean, just like the, the bits going back and forth yeah. between Garibald yeah. and Yorkus as we went on with Yorkus yes. being this big, mighty warrior he's trying to be <laughs> and Garibald's like this, you know, three foot yeah. thing standing beside him, but I'm blocking you with my shield and stepping yeah. on you <laughs> yeah. and the, by the end of it. Yeah. I, lo I love the, the, the juxtaposition of arrogance and earnest ness between yeah. those two characters is is lovely yeah <laughs> it was magical that was, a, that was that was a great time it was yeah. it was it was magical and um it, you know i was never uh, my military service i was not a sniper um however when it comes to the role playing scenes nearly <laughs> every character i play is just that i will get oh, those little zip little lines line. right in there yeah and you're yeah, like that's exactly what I'm chasing. Yeah. Where, where did that come from you know that, <laughs> that is what i do and i do it all the time like almost Damn every character i play that, <laughs> that, that that's my hallmark i would say i have an example of that a collaborative creativity shall we say between my players and i want you you can live vicariously through them to have a, a just a just a small piece of what they felt as it is such a drug but um in the game we played on tuesday as i said a couple of the player characters have died many moons ago they died to gibbering mouthers so there wasn't a lot left of their bodies they managed to salvage this the skull of one of them it's a bit morbid i have to say but that character was skull motifs left right and center so it actually kind of made sense that they would the one remnant they'd have of his body is his skull and they kind of kept it as a keepsake just in case it would be important the player character who picked it up was his close friend so he was like no do you know what i'm gonna keep this and honor him and he loved skulls so it kind of makes sense that he lives on as a skull anyway flash forward to <laughs> last session and i'm introducing the new player characters one of them has come back as an old friend of the one who is now just a skull who, who died so she comes in the room and she's like i'm here because i heard you were traveling with my friend i've heard that he's died i'm here to help avenge and whatnot and the guy with the skull is like i get out the skull and i give it to her 
and everyone in the <laughs> everyone at the table was like, whoa, 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 dude, there's a time and a place to offer <laughs> people their dead friends' skulls. And it just went quiet. And he went, yeah, this is the time I give her the skull. And everyone was like, oh, God. <laughs> no. This, no, is, no. this could go one of two ways. Uh, oh, nice. And fortunately, that new player uh, with the, the, this new character who'd come in was like, equally morbid and and you know like oh no i i can see i know what he's trying to do i can see what he's trying to do here i'm, I'm not gonna freak out and flip out and derail the whole thing they were just like yep yeah, cool thank you this means a lot and, and so on and so on but just at the collective gasp of everyone else being like why no the skull is not what you do when you first meet somebody that's like that's at least a second date thing come on now <laughs> right <laughs> there's got to be at least you know a uh, a uh, dinner involved yeah know? yeah you met the parents and then you whip out the skull of their friend like that's yeah, why not? <laughs> as you were telling the story i immediately went back to our tourist group and now the skull was the flag on the stick yeah. they were leaving <laughs> around, themselves around with to make sure nobody got lost that's canon in my universe now that is <laughs> so i i think listening to your show for the past year i know so many elements of your ongoing campaign I'm so sad to hear that it was the player character who had all the skulls and all that that ended up dying because I knew someone had passed, but I didn't know that that was the the character who had passed. Like I, I was, I was digging that character. Yes, the yeah. the the irony is not lost on the group uh, yeah. that the man who is all about death and and is it he's a cleric of the death domain, covered in skulls. And he's the first player character to die. Was poetic, I think, if you put it politely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Live by the skull. He had one foot in the grave. Man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, precisely, yeah. precisely. He, he was ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, let us uh, see this episode out then with perhaps talking of bones. Uh, a question with the most meat on said bones uh, in terms of storytellers as you call it or content creators or gms or however you want to do it what made the three of you want to talk to me this morning uh <laughs> it's a veiled <laughs> question <laughs> there. Yeah. josh told me to and he's scary if i don't do it <laughs> <laughs> no, i didn't even tell him to i just put the invite on your calendar and expected you to show up <laughs> That's fine. i will chain you to your desk again glenn <laughs> <laughs> Those jokes. That's that's why I'm here. <laughs> Case in point. Great. Um, <laughs> you know, a, a chance to throw out the road bacon bit again, um, yeah. which I used in the game we played last night uh, uh, for a brief moment. Like I think it, it has become something I'm going to start talking about all the time because I so love that bit. To be on the show, to be a content creator, to be a storyteller, what motivates me is creativity and innate creativeness. A long time ago, I was asked, how would you describe yourself? And they weren't talking about physically. So it's like, how would you describe yourself to people who want to know you? And oftentimes that question is answered by, oh, well, I do this for work. Well, work is not my definition of myself. Like the job I do nine to five, the reason I refer to it as a nine to five is because it is exclusively a means to an end. Mm -hmm. It pays the rent. It puts food on the table and covers my, uh, my medical benefits. Aside from that, it is not part of who I am. It is just something I am capable of and good at doing. I don't define myself that way. I define myself as a person who tells stories, shares experiences, and wants to always be worthy of the friendship I have received in life. Like I want to be a better friend always. The friends I have have been amazing. They've gotten me through all the difficult times. They've got, they've been with me through all the great times uh, and everything in between. So I am constantly striving to be that. So as a content creator, what motivates me is that combination of those three things. How do I tell stories that are enjoyable, that share my experiences and can somehow identify uh, or detail ways to be a better friend or a better person in some way. So as a storyteller, I, for instance, I don't often run quote unquote evil campaigns. That's just my take. I'm not saying that they're bad. I've played in a few and enjoyed them. Uh, I've run a few in the past and enjoyed it of late. It's just not what I do. It's not the kind of story I want to tell anymore. And so what motivates me is just that sharing experiences in a way that is additive and not subtractive. Yeah. 
and doing so in as creative a manner as possible. I love creativity. Just talking to anybody who does any creative endeavor is amazing to me, whether it be a musician of which I've dabbled with toyed with an actor of which role-playing is largely me dabbling and toying with mm -hmm. other content creators in this space. That's what motivates me is yeah. having those conversations and doing those things. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, the easy answer is that first of all, Lou Anika, you covered pretty much every bullet point that I had been thinking about when Danilo first asked the question for one. So screw you again. And secondly, <sighs> happily, you know, <laughs> secondly, <laughs> like, again, like, I mean, I think, I think about like, I think about this past year, cause I mean, you know, tabletop journeys came out in early December of, of 2020, early December of 2020. And so it's a little bit over, been over uh, a little bit over a year, you know, and I look back at the, at the last year and see, the awesome people that we have had the chance to talk to and the right. awesome things that we have had the chance to talk about, not even when the th three of us get together and blather on for an hour and change, but like the, the people out there that look, look, I did a thing. Can I just talk about it? And I'm like, yeah, come in, talk about your thing. Uh, you talk about that, like shared experience at the table where like, you just want, I just want my friends to, to do something awesome and inspire some, some feeling in me. There is nothing better than than being on that creative side and having somebody else give a crap about it. And to to talk to people about how passionate they are about their little corner of of the world. It sounds silly to say after only a year, but I'm honestly not sure like what else I would be doing with my time mm -hmm. if I hadn't decided to go ahead and do this, right? You know, and like we're all busy dudes. Like that like there's no no way to, no two ways about it right uh and and for anybody out there that is under the illusion that podcasting just sort of happens it's a thing mm. you can you know whatever right it's work <laughs> it like it's work like it is absolutely work i think i think the amount of times you've had to reschedule this speaks for itself <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. yeah yeah you know but man it's just so much fun like it really it like it's just like I get to spend my Sunday morning talking to to you guys and like, you know, you're what, 6,000 miles away and, and like, right. and we're talking about this shared experience that we all have. And that's really like, how could you not want to spend two hours or whatever talking technical issues be damned about, <laughs> you know, about, about the shared experience. Like we're talking about our shared experience as humans in kind of this, this very narrow scope. But we've covered so many other topics here. We're talking about so many other things kind of under that umbrella that apply. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know my very philosophical rambling answer is basically just saying, like, why wouldn't you want to do this? Like, <laughs> like right. if you need to be motivated to get up and do this, then – Don't do this. Don't do this, right? <laughs> because, like, like, the motivation is the thing. The motivation mm -hmm. is, the, is the conversation. The motivation is the, is the act of doing it, right? Like, that's what – that's what that's what got me up after six and a half hours of sleep last night to go. Ahead, oh, that's right. We're talking with Danilo today. Like finally, like we've been trying to put this together for the six months. Like that's great, that's fabulous. You know, yeah. that so. is what got me to roll out this early too. I mean, that, well, it's not even early, but we were up really late last night. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want the listeners to appreciate it. You making it sound like I got you out of bed at like four a.m. and it's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. It, it's totally, totally self induced. I mean, we started we started recording at like ten o'clock local time here in the U.S., but the three of us were up until about one thirty uh, doing it doing an actual play for our show last night so two you know two o'clock yeah. by the time i got to bed yeah uh, yeah. Last night. yeah yeah and the last thing i did when we signed off of that actual play which was a fantastic session really rewarding as well the last thing i did is i said see y'all at 10 a.m motivation and then and shut off the computer and went to bed yeah. you know yeah. and, and it was like in my head quite honestly in my my dreams it was like what am I going to talk about? What are my, what are the, the points I want to hit and where are my notes? Cause I, I write notes actually very close to when I do shows versus well in advance. Um, that way the ideas are fresh. They make sense, but I ruminate over them for the days that come up to that. And I got up this morning. I'm like, I'm going to take notes on what's said during this session so I can go back to points or touch on things that come up. But I know what I want to say about this. Like part of it is I am, and we are fairly self-motivated. So I just said, you know what? I don't need to really go to notes for this. Yeah. I, I know what I want to say. There may be a particular anecdote that I want to mention, but for the most part, 
Right. I know the things that drive me. I, I know the things that I love to do. And this type of game, role-playing games in general, that drives me. That makes me want to do more of this. I, I love when I build a character that has all these things that, that it can do. And I say all the time, I don't optimize for the sake of building the biggest, baddest. I optimize for having the coolest moment, mm -hmm. which sometimes is not always the biggest and the baddest. Right. You know, sometimes it's just being able to do that cool thing that nobody really anticipated. Yeah. One of the best things my Warforge in another game did was do a commander strike as a battle master and give it to the barbarian who laid the killing blow. I could have probably done just as much damage, but that would have never been as cool as I drop to one knee, say, get him, and I give him the, the ability to strike, and he says, well, I run up, I jump off his back as he stands up to launch me, and he drops the killing blow, lays out the, the big bad guy, which happened to be a giant, and uh, we took him out. And I'm like, that's badass. Yeah. <laughs> And then not only not only that, but because you, you, you talk about kind of like the 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 other side of of this as optimization, like you optimize for the story. That's not right. even kind of like the greatest role playing story that I can think of off the top of my head. The greatest role playing story that I can think of off the top of my head happened twenty years ago when we were at a table and the big bad of the campaign marched up with his army and the the soon to be king of the realm decided to go ahead and go out and said enough. Thousands of people aren't going to die and challenged the big bad to single combat and lost. And that set forth a dozen campaigns from that singular moment hmm. when the big bad won. And all of us are sitting at the table like, you can't, no, no, you can't do that. And the storyteller is like, out, get out of here. You're not here. You don't know what's happening. It's like, but no, but he can't, he's going to lose. <laughs> he's not going to win. <laughs> the out. Yeah. Ah! To be fair, oh. I was not at my best and most respectful player <laughs> character phase. Yeah. And I was ejected from that table for that yeah. moment while that oh. scene went down. Yeah. Um, but here we are 20 plus years later, and I'm playing in the campaign, and I have finally, the current character I play, uh, actually did some actions to successfully start to undo the damage done in that scene 20 years ago. <laughs> so uh, right. uh, I, I want you all to know that, you know, HK's got this. He, he, he's he, he's <laughs> worth some, that's some yeah. long reaching decades spanning motivation yeah. right there. Yeah. Um, but no, I have to, on the motivation front as a storyteller, agree with uh, both of my irreverent co-hosts and amazing <laughs> friends that the creative collaboration is definitely where, what it's all about. But for myself, I've always been, I said earlier, I'm a maker. I mean, I, <laughs> silly story, but when I was in like, oh, I don't know, first grade, I decided I was going to be a writer. So I locked myself in the bathroom. Why the bathroom? I have no idea, but the bathroom uh, for about three hours while I copied verbatim my very, very favorite book onto notebook paper, which earned me a nice conversation about plagiarism and, and, and a good life <laughs> lesson along the way. Uh, but I mean, it's been in me since then that I've always wanted to make things and it's just grown and grown forever. As a storyteller though, that has to bring me to the storyteller chair because as a character I was creating, but I wanted to do more, right? But what really, really keeps me coming back, which kind of sums up a number of the points in a scene that we've been discussing, as a storyteller is the expression on my character's faces when I really truly achieve that shock and awe factor. When a piece of my plot, a bit of my story just slaps them in the face and they're wide eyed, like didn't see it coming. What the hell just happened? And not in a bad way necessarily sometimes, you know, depending on, on the plot, but uh, the scene I'm thinking of in this instance is uh, what, what literally popped into my mind was the expression on one of our Patreon's faces and a character she played in the boiling seas named Ash. Um, when, as they've been going on and they have this memory issue since the game started, you know, they, they woke up all of them with no memory and they've been getting little flashes since And the moment when she meets somebody that she recognizes, she thinks, and then realizes, based on a picture above the bar on the conversation, that this is actually the granddaughter of a former paramour of hers, who's now telling her, but you died like 75 years ago. And she's also at the same time now wondering, wait, is this my granddaughter then? 
and is watching her face as and the rest of the party's faces as it went through at that point and and they realize that they're actually all dead people from the past that moment watching that revelation dawn and that that moment of collaboration together that that's what i'm in it for i've had uh, several instances in my game when a player or two have just stood up and walked away because they're like oh can't believe this is happening i need to this is crazy and that that's when i feel like i've succeeded (laughs) (laughs) well thank you very much gentlemen for this i I, i'm very 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 happy with this episode um as we have covered not only the play side of things the first hot section was all about making characters that want to go and adventure and, and how to do that but also the soft side of things you know why why we find ourselves here in a gaming hangover, some more than others, uh, around <laughs> <laughs> talking around yeah. this this right. kind of thing. I mean, almost uh, always worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to go out for a few drinks. I'm about to have maybe a legitimate hangover. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the key to a hangover is having the road bacon when you get back. That's <laughs> the key, so I don't know. Too much grease when you got a hangover is sometimes not a good thing. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I say road bacon this morning for me it was smoked salmon but whatever you know <laughs> is is there anything burning to talk about that we might have missed i was gonna say i actually think we we covered it all i was terribly afraid that we were gonna miss pieces but i think we we're getting really good at this the four of us together um <laughs> like we covered some good ground here i think we talked about all the things and uh that deal with motivation yeah the only burning question for me is when are we going to get you back on our show? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Never. Um, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I mean, yeah, no, I wouldn't want to be on our show either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm scheduled in for all of 2022, but who knows? If not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, ooh, I'm washing my hair that day. Uh, <laughs> when, whenever you'll, whenever you'll take me and my, what did you say? Uh, smooth, velvety smooth English accent, which is probably the best <laughs> compliment I've ever had on this very poor yeah. spoken Englishman's voice. <laughs> I, 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 I will say that when we started playing uh, against the Dark Master, what I originally had for a voice for my character, I changed because I'm like, we already have an English accent. And that's yeah, the You can't do a phony one next to a real <laughs> like, one. How I, would I'm that gonna, sound? I, I'm going to come across like an ass if I try that. Right now. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, I so I I did have to work work on that. Like I I literally have to work on some new accents because my goal is to keep gaming with you on a regular basis. <laughs> right. You have to try very hard to offend me. I'm afraid uh, <laughs> being uh, guilty of doing some poor accents in my time. So yes, oh, <laughs> mine are terrible. Like legendarily. Oh yeah, terrible. <laughs> All of mine turn into Scottish eventually if they go on long enough. Doesn't matter what they start as. <laughs> All roads lead to Edinburgh, as the saying goes. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's what the Scots will tell you in Edinburgh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, gentlemen, thank you again for gracing me with your presence today. It has been very, very enjoyable. Thank you all so much. Is there anything you would like to promote? Sure. Yeah. Well, so first of all, thank you for having us on. Obviously, I mean, this is such a good time. Uh, we, you know that you only have to call. We will we will rally <laughs> together to go ahead and come on your show anytime. Uh, Absolutely. You're willing to deal with uh, with three uh, three harsh New Englanders. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll 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 make the time to go ahead and make it happen. Um, you know. Obviously, the show continues to go ahead and run. We would love for uh, for your listeners to come check us out at www.ttjourneys.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at. TT Journeys. Uh, we're on Facebook. If you search for Tabletop Journeys, uh, we'd love for your listeners to go ahead and come check us out. Uh, our, our, we think our show is a good time. We love listening to ourselves talk, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, uh, we love other people to listen to us talk to. Kind of the big thing that we're looking to do for 2022 here is we are getting into, we alluded to content creation earlier. Uh, we put out our first kind of booklet at the uh, the very beginning of 2022, the 
Traveler's Guide to Collaborative World Building. Uh, but at the point that this episode is airing for you, uh, we will have just put out kind of our first uh, our first big boy book, you know, our, our first our, our first big book, uh, The Traveler's Guide to the Multiverse. It's a companion to the latest Wizards of the Coast book, uh, Monsters of the Multiverse. Uh, it is full of player options to go along with uh, with that tome. So backgrounds and feats uh, and magic items and mundane items uh, and you know, because we are because we are storytellers and content creators at heart, uh, there is a a big section on campaign hooks and adventure hooks and encounter hooks to go ahead and help bring all the uh, this kind of mechanical stuff that we're throwing into the book uh, help to bring it to your table uh, to make your multiverse campaign legendary. That's our tagline. If I didn't throw it in there, the lawyers would get upset. <laughs> yeah. Exceptionally professional. Thank you very much. <laughs> and he did it in his radio voice, which is really. <laughs> I do have to I mean, charge for that. Oh no, no, no there isn't. Good, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, uh, as usual, all the links will be in the episode description, not only to the DMs Guild, but also to uh, was it TTJourneys dot com. So yeah, I, I would encourage you all. They're, they are a lovely, lovely group of folks. I'm not. I, I mean, I say that off the record when we'll stop recording, so I'll say it on the record <laughs> as well. Uh, it is. It has been a pleasure. Uh, so yeah, all, all that's left is one final thank you, guys. Yeah. Pleasure is all ours, Daniela. Thank you very much for having us. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for listening at home. As usual, please do check out all the links in the episode description, of which there'll be be chock full with this episode of all glorious links to such great content. Thank you all for listening, and good night. And now it's time for the Patreon shout-outs. Huge, huge, huge thank you to a great friend of the show, Matthew Perkins, who's out there making hilarious and educational Dungeons & Dragons content. Please go and check out his stuff at matthewperkins.net, where you can find links to all of his socials and all of his content, including his own Patreon, which I would very much encourage you to check out. Thank you to Matt Street at MPStreet88, on Twitter, for supporting the show. If you need support running your personal or business schedule, head to virtualtimehustle.com or on Instagram to make that difference between should do and done. Boss it better with support from Kat, who will help you get back that essential time you've been searching for. If you would like to support what we do and get four shout outs a month, head over to patreon.com slash thinkingcritically, or you can just buy me a coffee at ko-fi.com slash thinkingcritically. 